Hello, one and all. Yes, hello. Um, on this on this most splendid of Saturdays, uh, to my submission for this week's Reddit challenge. Um, we have five rockets. Here they are on the launch pad. In fact, we can apply some sick VFX to show you what's inside those fairings, but not for too long because I don't want to get... We, we can reveal them as we go along. Um, but some of you might have seen my live stream on Thursday in which I designed, built and tested this craft. And now today you get the honour of watching the mission executed to its fullest. And this mission consists of five rockets, as I just said. There they are. They all were. I mean, we've launched the first one now. I probably could have done a countdown or at least not like, acknowledged it, but whatever. Um, for those out of the loop regarding what the challenge is and what I'm even talking about, uh, every week the KSP subreddit hosts a weekly challenge, and this week the challenge is to assemble a craft in orbit around Kerbin in five launches and then fly to Juno and back, which sounds simple enough, but the catch and uh, challenge, if you will, is that the payload for each of the five launches can't weigh more than two tons. Now that sounds like a lot at first, but to put that into perspective, uh, the nuclear engine weighs three tons, so we're talking very small parts here. Uh, the Mark II cockpit, you know, the SR-71 style one, uh, that weighs almost exactly two tons, just slightly over actually, so that kind of, to give you some sort of reference of how much mass we can utilise. I am just going to kind of talk and let the footage do the explaining because I feel like I'm just getting into orbit at this point. We can see the upper stage here, we have a little tug that pushes each component into place, and then we just launch the next rocket. But these tugs are fully recoverable, so um, we can save a little bit of money while we're playing on sandbox, so it doesn't really matter. Anyway, the more astute among you may have noticed that I've added the little mass readout below the altitude gauge, uh, so you can see how much uh, each craft, um, each module weighs. I mean, it will have the weight of the tug, so I guess you can ignore that. But you can see how much the craft weighs when it's fully assembled. Obviously, it needs to weigh less than 10 tonnes for each component to be sort of under 2 tonnes. Um, now since some of the payloads we're going to be attaching to the rocket don't have engines or probe cores themselves, I can't actually show you them on their own in the video uh, to see their individual mass, but you can download the craft file from the description if you are curious. But I did spend a good amount of time in the VAB uh, carefully picking lightweight parks and tweaking fuel levels to get as close as possible to the two ton limit. Okay, so um, now back to the challenge itself. Reddit challenges always have three tiers, right? So you've got normal mode, which is just what I've outlined above, hard mode and super mode. And for this challenge, hard mode requires you to not only assemble the craft and fly to Juno and back, which is normal mode, but you're also not allowed to transfer fuel between modules, which this rule confused me at first because my plan was to have multiple but separately launched fuel tanks that feed into a single engine. And I wasn't quite sure if that would be classified as fuel transfer in the challenge, so I double checked with the... With the, with the challenger, and it was all okay. Uh, Crossfeed is allowed, but transfer is not. So an example is that you can't just launch a big empty tank and refuel it with the other launches, if that makes sense. Um, but you can kind of dock tanks together and have one engine sort of automatically drain it through Crossfeed. It also made this mission uh, more complicated for me as well. Uh, essentially, I always like to go a little bit above and beyond with these challenges. So we're not only going to send Jebediah to Juna, but we're also going to send him to Ike as well. However, in a lapse of memory, I designed the ship to send down a separate lander for the Juna landing, and then have the lander return to the mothership, refuel itself, which would be crossfeed, um, uh, which would be fuel transfer, sorry, where it would then go on to land on Ike as well. However, I realised far too late that yes, this would actually constitute fuel transfer and disqualify me from hard mode, so... I had to get a little bit creative <laughs> with the Ike landing, but we'll save that for when we get to it. I also added a couple of other sort of arbitrary restrictions on myself. Number one is that I wanted it to be Apollo style in that we leave a uh, manned command module in orbit around Juna and a separate manned lander goes down to the surface. And the other challenge level, I guess, that I added is that I always like to have my Kerbals using actual command pods instead of just sitting on an external command seat uh, for the entire flight, which does add a significant chunk of weight, but it just makes the mission a little bit more satisfying. Now unfortunately, I only actually brought Jebediah with us on this mission, so while we will be leaving a command pod with crew capacity in Juno orbit, it will remain empty while the lander is off doing its thing down below. But, you know, I still kind of like the idea of having one command, command module dedicated to deep space navigation and stasis systems, while the other module is dedicated to landing and science collection, and it gives Jeb a bit more room to move around during this long mission. Uh, I don't know, I kind of like to play the game with little fantasies like this in the back of my mind, so, you know, kind of make a little backstory, I suppose, or lore uh, for the rockets and the ships, so you guys are kind of going to get an exclusive glimpse into my uh, distorted mindset right here. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was, um, there was one more parameter I set myself, and that is no ion engines. Not only would ion engines make the challenge absurdly easy, but they're just 
boring. Like, burns take so long, and most of the missions I do, as it is, use the nuclear engines, which also have an incredibly poor thrust-to-weight ratio, and I'm sick of using those um, for burns and stuff as it is. And ion engines are even worse, and so I just literally couldn't be bothered to use ion engines for this mission. And that's the beginning and end of my reasoning, so... Let's just recap the extra clauses I've set, Juna and Ike return, no command seats, two command pods, and no ion engines. I did say earlier that there is a tier above hard mode for Reddit challenges called Super Mode, the only requirement for this tier being to uh, impress the judge. I don't really think my additional layer of challenge is enough to promote this mission to a super mode entry, but I don't know, I just had a lot of fun doing this mission. Often, oftentimes my more large scale flights are filled with frustration, blood, sweat and tears, whereas, I don't know, this time it was just quite relaxing and satisfying, and because I designed and built it on a live stream, it was a good opportunity to interact with the viewers, so there we go. I certainly had more fun doing this challenge than a lot of my other missions, so there's that. Um, going back to the other ideas for this I had for this mission, I know with 110% certainty it's possible to go to Elu and back for this challenge, so I considered that at one point, um, and if I allowed myself to use ion engines and command seats, uh, it would be even easier. In fact, with gravity assist you could probably do Elu returns without ion. In fact, I'm almost certain you can. I might be so bold as to say as to go as far as saying that it's definitely possible to do Elu without ion using the parameters of this challenge. Um, but I don't know if I have the patience or will to do a mission like that myself. I'd rather do something a little bit more challenging, like, you know, make it a, a 60 seat ELU SSTO without ion or mining, or an, an SSTO that goes to ELU and lathe in one mission without ion or mining, or, or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's now time to launch the final module with Jebediah in it, but for some reason he wasn't in it. <laughs> it's a bit annoying because I specifically set it up so he would be in the final rocket. Um, but as I recall, before I began filming the mission, I realised one of the decouplers was upside down, so I had to revert to the VAB to fix it, and I think in doing so the game removed him from the cockpit. So, uh, luckily, Kerbals can transfer between command pods through a claw unit, so I threw together this beautiful uh, automobile here <laughs> to allow Jebediah to just board the rocket and begin his role on the mission by sort of transferring. So, it was a little bit cheaty, but, I mean, we could have just recovered the flight and rebuilt it in the VAB, so it's kind of, I don't know, it adds a bit more... Adds a little bit of comic relief for the video, maybe, but there he is, all ready to, uh, all ready to go. So I guess this is, um, this being the final launch, it's going to be the last chance I actually have to talk about the actual rockets themselves that I'm launching and the payloads within. Obviously there were five launches put into the construction of the mothership, phase one for the engines and power generation uh, modules, phase two and three being identical and were just fuel reserves. Stage four that we just did before this one was the deep space command module and re-entry capsule, and this is stage five, which is the Juna lander. Uh, the actual rockets that go into each module are pretty rubbish actually. The first stage is overkill, I had to spend most of the flight at half thrust or less, and the second stage has far too little fuel to get the craft fully into orbit. And then the final stage was just the tug that moves the modules into position so they don't have to expend any of their own fuel or need to be made heavier by requiring SAS wheels and probe cores to to control themselves so um and as you saw the tugs are fully recoverable which is a nice bonus <laughs> and i won't be using any monopellant in this mission uh, not just for assembling an lko but throughout the rest of the mission just because that meant we could drain the command mod pods of their monopellant reserves and save a little bit of extra weight just because obviously weight is the name of the game <laughs> in this challenge um and the more like when we're working on this scale you don't really need monopellant i mean the Modules are so lightweight and they have extremely quick responses with the reaction wheels and they have a very high thrust to weight ratio so you know they can easily be aligned by the magnets in the docking ports once we're approaching docking distance almost to the point where it's basically automated just you know point yourself at the docking port you want to attach to and coast towards it about half a meter per second and the and the pieces just snap together. <laughs> So now we have the entire ship assembled, it's time to set a course for Juna. Now, I launched at the correct time, so we would immediately be able to get a nice efficient transfer to Juna off the bat, and you can see I made a maneuver note here, and immediately managed to get an encounter with the red planet straight away, which was nice. And if we wanted to be really efficient here, we could split our escape bone over two passes at Kerbin Periapsis to maximise our use of the Oberth effect, but you know, because we have excellent thrust to weight ratio and our burn time is pretty short as it is, um, it wouldn't have had a particularly significant impact, so... You know, I didn't. I just did it in one launch, and also I'm I'm very lazy, which is something that you should also is also something worth considering. Uh, we'll be saving a fair amount of fuel by aero capturing at Juna rather than doing a retrograde burn to circularize. So we'll we'll be saving fuel as we go along. I guess we can talk about the craft at hand here as well. Um, I had to make sure. Well, I mean, it's not on the screen now. Will I bring it back at some point? Ah, uh, we'll we'll talk about that as and when we're do doing it. we uh, as and when it's visible on the screen, but. Uh, just, yeah, we're just doing a quick transfer, do a mid-course correction. If I want it to be, you know, 
proper pro <laughs> at this um in this mission i could have probably got, got the injuna the junior encounter from kerbin's fifth influence but uh, this way is just a lot easier and yeah there was no there wasn't much incentive to uh do it all at once and i'm just sort of stalling waiting for the craft to actually get to juno so you can see it again and we can talk a little bit more about the actual you know the actual parts that it consists of. So you may have noticed earlier I had to make sure I disabled crossfeed to and from the lander module because otherwise if I forgot to uh, the main terrier engine would drain fuel from the lander as well as the mothership and so I wouldn't and I wouldn't be able to refill the lander once we came to needing it because that would be fuel transfer and would break the rules for hard mode. And I also had to uh, make sure I enabled crossfeed on the decoupler on the re-entry module the bit that separates it um, so obviously the re-entry module will need to detach from the rest of the ship um, so it can re-enter at Kerbin and that requires a decoupler but decouplers by default don't permit crossfeed so you kind of have to enable it yourself. There are also a couple of artistic flares on this ship due to the fact that the modules were slightly underweight but not to the point where I could just add more fuel so you know such flares include the beautiful three-way symmetry on the solar panels and the two communication aerials on the deep space navigation and re-entry unit which serve literally zero purpose other than looking cool and you know I've got the slightly more powerful terrier engine driving this ship as opposed to a smaller and more efficient engine since you know I had the extra delta v to spend on a bigger thruster and you know, it's just a bit more you know fun <laughs> to have a slightly more powerful engine. Now I could have saved a bunch of weight flying this mission using only one of the fuel tank units at a time and then dumping them once used so we're kind of almost like an asparagus kind of configuration at the time but at the time i thought this would break the challenge rule since i'd have to manually empty one of the fuel tanks to restock the fellow tanks uh, and then dump it after that but after filming the whole thing i realized i could have just disabled the tanks individually until i needed them so that the craft would just drain the tanks i wanted to dump naturally if that makes sense without needing fuel transfer but you know oh well you live and learn i suppose um so yeah uh, we kind of We've done it now, but entry at Juno was, was a little bit of trial and error just to find the best altitude error capture at, especially the second error break. But overheating wasn't really an issue I was worried about due to the, you know, the fact that Juno's atmosphere is extremely thin. So atmospheric entry is almost a non-existent issue, uh, particularly coming from Kerbin where your relative speed to the planet would be very high. Um, and there we are landing <laughs> i kind of haven't really done a good job in talking about exactly what's going on on screen, but you guys know how to get to Juno or if you don't. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, <laughs> but there we are. We're, we're we're on the surface of Juno, so I guess we can do our standard EVA activities. Get Jebediah out of that command pod, and he can run around and plant his flag, which you know, a real a real tear jerking moment. So anyway, yes, uh, the lander design. Now you can see the lander in the background. Uh, to save weight, I didn't bother with a parachute, since, you know, the lander has enough fuel to manage a powered landing anyway. I also went with three landing legs instead of the recommended four, because A, it looks a lot cooler, and B, it saves on weight again. I mean, I say four is usually the recommended minimum, uh, because three is a lot more unstable, but since we landed somewhere fairly flat, it wasn't really an issue. And also, this is an incredibly lightweight lander, so, you know, it's unlikely to topple over, it's got a low centre of gravity. So some of you may have noticed that this lander isn't particularly aerodynamic, which isn't an, an enormous issue on Juno because of how thin the atmosphere is, but it's still significant enough where the lander does cause a bit of drag. So I went with a fairly steep ascent profile to get us out of the thickest parts of the atmosphere first, where air resistance will be at its most significant, uh, you know, as fast as possible. But once we're well on the path to space, we can begin to flatten out our pitch and focus on... Uh, focus our remaining fuel on horizontal acceleration and you know after playing around a bit with our target and retrograde marks on the nav ball in no time at all we have ourselves a nice and close approach with the mothership so we can you know begin our docking procedure just talking about the pace of this video by the way i have cut a lot of it out because a lot of it is is like the rendezvous particularly the first segment of this video i already i already feel like it was it was too long but i have unfortunately because the video the footage has been moving so fast i haven't really been able to describe exactly what's going on in real time so is this annoying like i could make i could talk about what's going on in real time but because things move so fast i'd have to slow it right down so the video would end up being like half an hour long i mean you might you guys might like that if you if you if you would prefer that then do let me know but i kind of feel like this it's kind of this kind of commentary style strikes a happy medium <laughs> between you know kind of Oh uh, yeah, Jebediah kind of glitched out just then. Uh, happy medium between, you know, keeping the, the pace of the video up whilst also kind of remaining coherent in the commentary track. I mean, there'll always be a degree of, you know, nonsense in my commentaries, but whatever. So we're going to ditch the lander then, because like I said, the original plan was to uh, refuel it and then use the lander to land on Ike. But then I remembered that we can't do fuel transfer. I mean, it probably would have been allowed, let's face it, but 
whatever. So I thought, well, the only option we have then is to um, land with the mothership. So here we are at Ike Sands, our lander. And so we're going to have to land the entire mothership on the surface. Something it was never designed to do, as you can see. It's, it's very tall and only has a small engine to rest on. So we're going to have to land somewhere pretty flat and see if we can balance it on the engine nozzle while we conduct our surface walk. Or, or surface run, I should say. Or well, I guess surface waddle in Jeb's case. Uh, but whatever. Whatever we do, <laughs> it'll have to be fast before the ship ends up toppling over. There we go, because I was kind of uh, clenching, see if I can make it stay steady. I had the solar panels retracted just in case it started to fall, because some on, there was not there was a chance that the solar panel might have been able to take the weight of the rocket and hold it vertical, but in the end it didn't matter. So just very surgical precision in getting Jeva Jebediah off the thing without him knocking it over. And you know, just very quickly you can see me like planting his flag. Nice little salute. And waste no time quickly just typing the most minimalist description we can for the flag and trying to get Jebediah on. I was trying to make sure he didn't just like smash into the side of the rocket because as I'm sorry you saw, this thing is incredibly unstable. But there we go. And then we can waste no time at all in throttling up and pointing ourselves, getting ourselves into an orbit. So Ike is extremely easy to land on and get to, uh, to land on and take off from. Uh, you only need 390 meters per second of fuel. So a Kerbal can land on Ike or take off from Ike and get into orbit. It doesn't have enough, Kerbals don't have enough fuel to do both. But I mean, if you had a lander that only had enough fuel to get to the surface of Ike, your Kerbal would have enough fuel to get into orbit again. So that's just something. And then we can use the mod Kerbal uh, alarm clock to get ourselves on a get ourselves a transfer window to get back to Kerbin, because as you, as you can see, we only have a very, very small amount of Delta V there. What is that? 519 meters per second. So we're going to have to be doing a lot of budgeting <laughs> to get our encounter just right. But luckily, we managed to do it. So as you can see, yeah, barely any Delta V remaining. It's going to be a tight squeeze to get our Kerbin encounter. So first things first, we got the, orb the optimal transfer window. And then what we're going to do is we're going to leave Ike orbit to put ourselves on a rough Juno orbit. And from there, I spent some time mucking around with Minuminos to find a series of burns that could get us back to Kerbin within budget. It took longer than I'd be willing to admit to find a sequence of burns that would be able to get the ship back to Kerbin um, with the fuel it's got. But long story short is that we have enough fuel by the absolute skin of our teeth. We ended up with five meters per second of fuel remaining. Haters will say it's fake. But I mean, you, I probably if I'd spent longer, you could have saved even more way, even more fuel. Um, the obvious, uh, one of the obvious ways I could have saved fuel was by doing an Ike gravity assist, but luckily it never came to that. I never got that desperate for um, extra range. Now for Kerbin re-entry itself, obviously we are now on a collision course, or like atmospheric collision course with uh, with Kerbin, and the uh, the deep space navigation pod also pulls shift as the re-entry capsule, complete with a parachute and ablative heat shield, and since we're only coming from Juna, and from a fairly efficient route at that, our re-entry speed won't be particularly high, so we can easily withstand the heating effects. I knew this would be the case before I embarked on this voyage, which is why I designed the craft re-entry unit to have a shield with only half of its potential ablative material, and I didn't even need that. We only used, a, uh, we only used like 50 units of ablative material there, so, you know. It, it was all we needed, but the reason I wound up halved the ablative units is because it was all part of the part of the effort to save on mass. But there we go. That pretty much wraps that mission up. So I hope you enjoyed this Reddit challenge. Next week, hopefully, will be Blunderbirds. But I'm 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 off to London uh, to university for some lectures next week, so it's going to be pretty hectic. So I don't know how much time I'll have to dedicate to KSP videos. So they, I hopefully will have the Blunderbirds ready for next week. But it, that's what, that's to, to be announced. <laughs> But anyway, nothing else to talk about really other than what's on screen. Top left is the playlist of Reddit challenges. Top right is the music video version of this video, which came out great in my opinion. So I hope you enjoy that one. Uh, bottom left is just my most recent upload. And bottom right was specially chosen by YouTube's algorithm just for you. Other than that, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, or in the description. And have a good day. <laughs> Never gets weird, that ending.